and Understanding, and on behalf of ACMCU and our co-sponsors, generous co-sponsors, uh, the Center for Contemporary Arabic Studies, whose house we're in right now, uh, and the Program in Catholic Studies, and the History Department, and the Center for Latin American Studies. Thank you all for being here. Uh, for today's program, Yalla Illa Amrika, Formation of Arab Christian Communities in Latin America. I want to thank, first of all, our esteemed colleague, Dr. Yvonne Haddad, whose idea this was and has been for several years, and I'm going to we're finally getting it done. Uh, and we're delighted to welcome as well our four distinguished speakers, one of whom are blocking the view of, sorry about that. No, you're fine. Um, Dr. Stephen Hyland of the Department of History and Political Science at Wingate University. Dr. John Tofi Karam at the Department of Spanish and Portuguese and the Lehman Center for Brazilian, Studi Brazilian Studies at the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana. I know it's supposed to be Urbana-Champaign now, but I was at University of Chicago when it was still Champaign-Urbana. Um, Dr. Camila Pastor de Maria Campos, uh, of the History Division of the Center for Economic Research and Teaching, CIDE, in Mexico City, and Nicholas Veskin and Wiley of Sociology, Middle East Studies in North African Studies at uh, Northwestern University. Your programs have their bios, brief bios on them, so I won't go through all the bios. Uh, but I will simply turn it over to our first speaker, who will do uh, introduction, introductory uh, overview and then move into his specific case study. Uh, we'll do all four in a row, and then we'll have some discussion in Q&A, and then I will turn it over to Dr. Haddad to moderate. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for the, the invitation and the opportunity, Professor Dent, Professor Song. Uh, thank you to the uh, Awalid Vinicolau Center for Muslim Christian Understanding. It's always a pleasure to share a stage with John and Camila. It's a pleasure to meet Nick for the first time. Um, so over the, the next coming minutes, uh, I'd like to give a general presentation over migration out of the Eastern Mediterranean into Argentina, and if I still have some time left over, a couple case studies, very short comments about the Maronite community in Northern Argentina and the Greek Orthodox community in Northern Argentina as well. And I'd like to start with this, this photo right here, which was found in the National Archive in, in Buenos Aires. Uh, it's a picture from 1904, and you see uh, in the center of it a Greek Melkite bishop by the name of Cyril Mogavgat. In 1926, he would become the patriarch of the Greek Melkite Church. And it's an important photo for a variety of reasons. One, you see the Argentine national flag on, on the left side, and then the Ottoman flag. Uh, the two gentlemen that are standing in the back are the Shamun brothers, the Maronite Catholics from Del Kama. Uh, and they would, be, they would publish the most important Arabic language periodical in Argentina, beginning in 1902, roughly, and lasting into the 1960s. They both died in the early 1940s, but they set the stage. And most of these men um, would have been some of the leading members, merchants primarily, um, to receive Bishop Mogavgat and some local uh, priests as well. And you can see some dignitaries up high on the wall, including not only Argentine politicians, uh, but also apparently some Ottoman officials as well. Uh, what's important about this image is that, is there? <coughs> It's even before that. These Christian communities in Latin America are in contact with the leadership of their religious communities in the old country. And they are they're communicating with them using, you know, uh, by this point you have standardized international mail service. So they're sending letters back, they're requesting their patriarchs, their particular patriarchs to send priests. Uh, to serve the faithful in these communities. And these are largely communities with uh, critical mass, if you will. Um, 
and because they want to baptize their children into the church. They want to have marriage according to their the rights that they, you know, in the churches that they grew up in. And to their credit, the patriarchs uh, complied and provided these, uh, the, I mean, they sent them out. And they built institutions, they built churches, and these churches are still around. Uh, so this is the story I'd like to, to introduce to you. These institutions are also important for a couple reasons. One, obviously, it helped them maintain a tie to the old country, to the homeland family members and, and, and whatnot. Uh, they're also important because it helped, whether perceived or real, control the process of integration and adaptation to their new society, especially when they had children. Uh, the third thing is it became a space of sociability, a space where you could build community. <coughs> and, and fourthly, before you begin to see the rise of, say, lay community institutions like the Syrian Lebanese Society, uh, or the Lebanese Center, these sorts of things, they would be important resources for both individual or collective need uh, at, at a given moment. So this is a map of the Eastern Mediterranean at the end of uh, roughly, say, 1900. Um, and Kamal Karpat said between 450 and 600,000 Eastern Syrians and Lebanese had, had immigrated by the first uh, World War. Uh, and this represents more than 15% of the regional population. This compares actually quite well with the Italian experience. Roughly 15 to 18% of Italians had immigrated at roughly the same time period. Now certainly in terms of absolute numbers, the Italian immigrant population was significantly larger. But uh, if you look at rates, if you look at percentages, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it compares uh, quite nicely. The other thing is that it's important to, I know we're emphasizing or focusing on the Christian communities, but the Jewish populations and the Muslim populations also uh, immigrated as well, but the flows oscillated, the rhythms of the out-migration uh, were different at particular moments. Uh, and immigrants came, came from particular zones. Obviously the communities that were closest to or were in port environments were the first to leave and then the process begins to catch on, it becomes an acceptable life choice, it becomes a cultural practice, and it begins to move into, uh, into the interior portions of the Ottoman provinces. Uh, in many ways, following the, the building of the rail lines uh, as well, you can see as they connect, it begins to accelerate the outflow uh, of migration. Uh, the, it, and especially in the case of the Greek Orthodox in Argentina, the, the zone, the Valley of the Christians, was a massive zone that uh, was a massive zone that produced a tremendous amount uh, of immigrants uh, leaving. So again, it's a Christian phenomenon at first, but it changes uh, by the time we're getting into the years right before the First World War. I mean, forty percent of immigrants leaving Tripoli, uh, Beirut province, were Muslim. 35% uh, of immigrants leaving from the Jerusalem government in 1913 were Muslim as well. In 1909, according to Argentine statistics, 40% of immigrants self-identified as Muslim. I mean, so this is a substantial portion. It's uh, obviously it's still majority uh, Christian, but the uh, the Muslim population was significant. Uh, there was an article that actually John put me on to that was written in the beginning of the 20th century, and a German scholar interviews a, a newspaper publisher, a Syrian or Lebanese newspaper publisher in Lebanon, and he already notes the sizable Muslim communities uh, in, in Argentina at the time. So where were the primary destinations? Uh, you can see right here that in 1926, it is substantial, but they are in concentrated location. So you have nearly 150,000 in Argentina. Uh, the United States is the largest community at 165, and Brazil is a very large community. Um, 16,000 in Cuba, Mexico as well, roughly the same size, and then the population numbers diminish. The other thing that's very important in thinking about this, both the Christian communities, but say the Syrian Lebanese population more broadly, was the importance of newspaper, the print media. It helped connect these communities internationally, 
but it also helped form and organize these communities in whatever country that they were in. The province that I study, Tucumán, which is in the far northwest of, of, uh, of Argentina, I'll show it on the next map, uh, the next slide or two. In the 1920s, this is a community of say between four and 10,000 um, people. They had at least six Arabic language periodicals in the 1920s alone. So it's a reflection of wealth, but it's also a reflection of say the uh, level of education of many of these, these immigrants. So Argentina, which is the, uh, the country that I focus on, was the second most popular destination for immigrants in the Americas. Certainly, the United States was by far the, the uh, most popular destination. Argentina was number two. Canada and Brazil were in there third and fourth. Uh, the thing about Argentina is that an overwhelming number stayed permanently, more than half. Within the community, the Syrian Lebanese community, they say well north of 80% of immigrants who arrived in Argentina settled permanently. Uh, Argentina, like the United States, like Brazil, like Canada, well, is the part of their national myth is that it's a nation of immigrants. Much more so than, say, the United States. The United States in this time period, maybe 12%, 14% uh, immigrant, but Argentina, almost one in three of the national population. And then the national capital itself, one in two. I mean, there were 300,000 Italians in Buenos Aires in 1914. There was 300,000 Spaniards in Buenos Aires in 1914. It's just an astonishing uh, feature. Now, as you can imagine, uh, like the United States then and now, it created all sorts of discussions, one might say, uh, among social elite, political elite, so on and so forth, as to what should we do with all these people. I'll get to this, and well, I can look at it now. By the time you get into the mandate, the French are very, very interested in the Syrian uh, Lebanese populations abroad for a variety of reasons. One, they are a huge source of remittances. Uh, when you look at, for instance, if you're looking at the spread of the, of the Ottoman Imperial Bank, right, when they establish branch locations before World War I, they're always in uh, heavy immigrant zones like Hama, Homs, obviously Beirut. Zahde, these sorts of places. So uh, the expansion of the, of the Ottoman Imperial Bank reflect where these are coming. So the French are very concerned. And just to kind of give you a sense of, of the diversity, this data is taken from a report written by a guy named Shekri Abisab. He was the, the dragoman, the translator at the French Embassy in Buenos Aires. He was also responsible for the Syrian and Lebanese communities uh, subsequent to the Treaty of Lausanne and the, and the formation of the, of the French Mandate. So he had to provide these numbers and also break it down uh, religiously uh, or, or according to confessional identities, some of which he did well, some of which he just says, yeah, mainly Maronite, uh, mainly Orthodox. So of uh, the Lebanese that are there, and he's using the borders of the mandate, right? So Lebanese, you have 80,000, uh, 53,000 uh, 53, of which he identifies as Christians, mainly Maronite, okay? But Greek Melkites are in there uh, in the light. You can see um, the Muslim population there, uh, the Jewish population in the light. Syrians, 60,000, 35,000 of which are mainly Orthodox, but you also have Syriac Orthodox. <coughs> immigrants to, you have Sunni Muslims, the Druze, there are far more than 500 Druze. Okay, I don't know why or how he came up with these. I don't know how he came up with any of these numbers, so take it with a grain of, of salt. Yeah, from Latakia, these are primary Alawites. There's a large Alawite population, very robust, still in Argentina. They have their own institutions, cultural and religious as well, uh, in Argentina. Uh, and then you get to see the total. So within the Christian community, the majority were Lebanese Christians, the majority of which of those were Maronite, roughly two out of every three, 60%. This bottom one, following the Treaty of Lausanne, the French were tasked with compelling these immigrants in the diaspora, not just in Argentina, but uh, I'm sure you see it in Mexico as well and in Brazil, that they, these immigrants had to choose a nationality. 
are you Syrian? Are you Lebanese? And if you don't answer, we're going to make you Turks. Okay? So of the 80,000 Lebanese, only 6,300 had bothered to fill out the paperwork. And this was a source of consternation for the French diplomats. And they kept sending out missive after missive to the different consuls, like, can you ask these people, are they Syrian, are they Lebanese, or we're going to make them Turks. <coughs> they complained that many of these immigrants decided to take Argentine citizenship. They maintain their Ottoman identity papers. The Argentine state uh, continues to refer to them as Ottomans, but they were not terribly interested in going forward with that uh, option. Okay. So who were the Christians that came to Argentina? I'll begin by <coughs> mentioning the communities that created parochial institutions in Argentina because these are obviously the easiest to identify. And I am sure that Levantine Christians, such as Protestant converts, and there were them, um, were in Argentina even if they never reached critical mass to build these institutions or want, warrant the dispatch of priests to serve the emigres. As such, the organized Eastern Rite and Eastern Orthodox Christian <coughs> communities were the Syriac Orthodox Church of Antioch, the Melkite Greek Catholics, both Armenian Catholics, which is the Patriarchate of uh, Cilicia in Lebanon, and the Apostolic Armenians, which are the Armenians from Armenia, uh, the Antiochian Orthodox Christians, which are, that's the, by far the largest Orthodox community, and then the Maronite Catholics. So I'll start with the, the smaller communities first. The Syriac Orthodox Church of Antioch, like most other other immigrants from the Eastern Mediterranean, Syriac Orthodox began arriving in Argentina by the end of the 19th century. It is a tiny community. It's, it's quite small. There's really, there's no scholarship on this, on this community that I have been able to find to date. But there's enough of them where they have created four distinct churches in different areas uh, of Argentina. The three most important centers are in Uh, the most important in, in the cathedral is in La Plata, which is the, the capital of the province of Buenos Aires. So it's about a 30 minute drive. It is, my mouse is working, there we go. La Plata is right there. You can see Buenos Aires is there. That's where the cathedral is at. They do have a church in the city of Buenos Aires. It's in a middle class neighborhood and it's in a repurposed house. It's very, very small. And on the outside of it, they say that they have a centro para estudios arameos, so you can study Arab, uh, Aramaic excuse me, at this, uh, at this location. Uh, they have a church in Cordoba, uh, and they also have uh, another church in Santiago del Estero. So Cordoba right here has a massive Melkite population and a massive Greek Orthodox population as well, and then you have Santiago del Estero, which is the neighboring province to the north. This is an interesting community because in January of 2018, the Syrian Orthodox Church ordained its first priest in Argentina. <clears throat> Prior to that, all priests had been ordained abroad and then dispatched, sent uh, to Argentina. Uh, this past June, the Syrian Orthodox Patriarch Ignatius Ephraim II visited Argentina, and he was shepherded around by the Syrian Chief of Mission, or so the Chief of Mission of the Syrian Embassy, uh, going around, um, and. I'm curious if this is part of the public diplomacy. As I understand, do Syrians have an embassy in, in Brazil? Yeah, they do? They don't in Mexico. They don't in Mexico. So this is, uh, it's still an important community, not only for the Syriac Orthodox, but also for the Syrian government. It's a huge source uh, of money, uh, of remittances. So that's the Syriac Orthodox Church of Antioch. The second are the Melkite Greek Catholics. Uh, they came in two principal waves, between 1910 and 1930, and this is largely between 1910 and 1914, and then in the 1920s, and it shuts down for uh, the Great Depression, and then they come again in 1949-1950. Most who came, came from present-day Syria and Lebanon, but there were some Palestinian families, and then sprinkled in there some from Egyptian and Jordanian territories. Estimated in 1992, the Greek Mel Melkites are said, were said to have numbered 15,000. 
However, the external church, right? So the church in Buenos Aires now has asserted a robust number of 400,000 adherents today in 2019. I'm not going to pass judgment on that assessment. That's, I mean, that's 1% of the, of the Argentine national population. I mean, it's a substantial number uh, of adherents. The three most important centers are in Buenos Aires, again, the, the capital, uh, Córdoba, and Rosario. Rosario is a riverine town uh, right up here where there is a large Syrian Lebanese uh, population of all confessional faiths. There are also smaller communities in Tucumán, up in the north, Catamarca, uh, which is to the uh, west of Tucumán and Santiago del Estero. Uh, they're also in Santiago del Estero in Mendoza. Mendoza is the great wine producing area of Argentina. The largest community is in Córdoba, and they are said to number some 50,000 people. And for this reason, the Curia, the head of the, uh, of the Argentine church, is headquartered there. Um, John Paul II created the Apostolic Exarchate in Argentina for Melkites in April 2002, and they've had three bishops to date, and Ibrahim Salame, who's technically the Bishop of Palmyra, and is also the Exarch of Argentina. Um, next are the Armenian, I guess, for the Melkites, they have three parishes, they have three churches and chapels. Ooh, okay. All right. Next, Armenian Catholics. <laughs> The Armenian community is said to number some 80,000 people. However, only 20% uh, are from uh, what is now Lebanon uh, and Syria. The first priest arrived in 1922 from the Keswarwan district of Mount Lebanon. Uh, he remained only one year. Armenian immigrants had written to the patriarch asking for priests to provide the sacraments of baptism and marriage, but also to tend to the infirm and the ill. Uh, the organization of the community began in earnest in 1924 with the arrival of Father Juan Bautista Cazesian. Uh, he published a journal, La Revista Armenia, it's still around uh, to this day. In 1981, John Paul II created the Apostolic Armenian Exarchate for Latin America, again headquartered in Buenos Aires because this is kind of the mother colony of Armenian, uh, Lebanese Armenian Catholics. Um, Antiochian Orthodox Christians, this is the fourth group uh, that I'm focusing on. Um, again, they're part of the surge of Levantine immigrants that arrive in Argentina in the late 1890s. Depending on who you ask, <coughs> they are the largest Arab Christian population in Argentina. Maronites will dispute it, say, no, we're larger. Uh, so it's, it's kind of fun and boring at the same time when they get into it. Uh, what is interesting is by 1915, the Orthodox women organized a mutual aid society to benefit the urban poor. This is in the capital of Buenos Aires. So it's an expression of one, solidarity of community, but also a level of prosperity and wealth that allows them to have these sorts of resources that they can marshal uh, and, and give out. Um, community members continue to write Patriarch uh, uh, Gregory IV, uh, who began sending priests. He sent Father Ignacio Aburus in 1918 to become the first patriarchal vicar for the administration of the church in Argentina, Paraguay, Chile, and Uruguay. So again, you have organized communities that are there, they have priests that are there, but the mother colony is in Argentina. Uh, in 1927, Monsignor Miguel Jaluf is named as the Patriarchal Vicar General. Jaluf had previously been a priest whose ministry was in Córdoba in the, in the interior. Uh, and the 1920s saw this wealthy community, they were actually a very wealthy community. Many of these immigrants were from Homs in Hama and in the Valley of the Christians. They began to raise money to build a church and a school located then in down, what is now downtown Buenos Aires, just around the corner from the foreign ministry. What is interesting about the Orthodox, though, is that the, the initial organization of this community actually didn't take place in the capital. It took, took place up in the north, in Santiago del Estero, in Tucumán, in the far, far uh, interior. The Orthodox community in Santiago del Estero constructed the first Antiochian Orthodox Church in 1914. This community was rather wealthy and set up to create a school, provide aid for the poor and infirm. They also established a, a church in the small town of Tintina in 1925, which was led by Father uh, Juri, who arrived the year before. The community in Santiago del Estero alone was said to have numbered 6,000 people 
by 1928. I mean, and this is a this is a province that had very few immigrants, and its population alone was probably only 100,000 uh, total population. Yeah. Finally, the Maronite Catholics, and then I will cede my I'll cede the floor. Uh, two Lebanese missionaries. It's an order of priests, or an order of Maronite Catholic priests. Father Miguel Hajar and Father Juan uh, Gosen arrived in 1901. They established the Colegio San Maron, located also in what is now downtown Buenos Aires. It was designed to impart uh, cultural traditions and serve as a school inculcating religious practices and other cultural norms. Uh, it also served as a boarding school because you had many Maronites that radiated out into the countryside and as they were raising their families, they sent their kids back to Buenos Aires to receive this parochial education. The other thing that the Maronites do in Buenos Aires, in 1913 they establish a printing house and they begin publishing a newspaper called Al Marcel, um, a missionero, the, the missionary. This was very important for a couple reasons. One, it gave information, it was a, con it was, it was a uh, a central node for the distribution of information about the Maronite community, but these guys, were, these Maronite priests, were very much Lebanese nationalists. So this is when you begin to see some of the Phoenicianism that you see in other areas in Latin America begin to filter into or among certain elements of the Lebanese Maronite population. Uh, this was a newspaper that would be published well into the 1950s. I mean, it stayed around for quite some time. It makes a transition in the 1930s to Spanish only, but up until then it was uh, only in, in Arabic. Uh, you can access that one in archives in, in Buenos Aires as well as in Lebanon. Uh, what is interesting, real quick, and then uh, I will shut it down. Uh, in the school, the priests built a chapel to celebrate mass and other rituals according to Maronite rites, but they weren't allowed to set up a parish. So while they had permission, because they're a union branch of the Roman Catholic Church, they were able to do that in Lebanon, right, because it's an established one, but they couldn't do it in the diaspora. So they didn't have official permission to operate in this chapel that they had built officially until 1925. And what is finally, uh, one last final thing that, that I uh, found interesting about uh, this community is that they were given sort of permission. They were given full permission from the Roman Catholic Church in 1962. And this followed a papal bull decreeing that parishes for Eastern Rite communities in the diaspora could actually be formed and recognized formally by Rome. So thus, in January 1st, 1962, Cardinal Antonio Caggiano, the Archbishop of Buenos Aires, and the ordinary responsible for the Eastern Rite churches in Argentina with the stroke of a pen, created four Maronite parishes, one in the capital, one in the province of Buenos Aires, just across the city uh, line, uh, one in Godoy Cruz, which is in Mendoza pro uh, province. Uh, many Maronites got into the winemaking business. And then finally, in San Miguel de Tucumán. Again, these, uh, these institutions that they built, all of them are still with us today. And in this moment of when uh, this community was organizing itself, they provided important roles in terms of sociability, uh, integration and adaptation to local communities, and more importantly, when they began to raise families as spaces to inculcate values for their kids. Thank you very much for your time. Many, many thanks to Professor Hadley, Professor Son, the al -Walid, the Center for Muslim Christian Understanding, the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies, and it is a real pleasure to sit beside Steve, Stephen, and Camilla, and, and to meet Nicholas for the first time, really. Uh, it's, it's a real uh, pleasure and privilege. Uh, in 2019, uh, the São Jorge Orthodox Church in Brazil's capital, Brasilia, celebrated in Arraial Arabi, Arraia Arabi. The term Arraia refers to the place where Roman Catholics celebrate the feast days for St. Anthony, uh, St. John, and St. Peter in a country or rustic style. Uh, but St. Georges uh, Orthodox Christians mixed, quote unquote, their ahaya with what they call Arab culture, uh, blending cowboy hats with kafigas, uh, hot dogs with kafta, uh, and country dances with the belly dance. So my paper focuses on this mixing of Messiaen uh, Christians in Arabic, namely those in the Orthodox 
church, the Antiochian uh, Orthodox Church, as well as those in Maronite and Melkite or Eastern Rite uh, uh, churches. Uh, it's uh, based on uh, ethnographic and historical research. Uh, I bring together much earlier work from 2000, 2001 that I did in, in mostly Hugues and Jean São Paulo, my gray hair showing, uh, as well as more recent work that I did in Brazil and Goiânia, uh, recently in 2019. And I integrate a, a lot of the growing scholarship in, the, in these two decades <laughs> that have passed. I argue that mixture is both a containment and convertibility of difference. On the one hand, uh, Syrian, Lebanese, Maronite, Melkite, and Orthodox took up Brazilian Roman Catholicism, Protestantism, Spiritism, and to a lesser extent, uh, Afro-Brazilian religions of Umbona and Canumblé. On the other hand, Brazilians with no Syrian Lebanese ancestry converted to Maronite, Melkite, and Orthodox denominations. So Syrian Lebanese Christian difference is made containable and convertible in what anthropologist Richard Wolfe called the structure of common difference. Uh, here the cultural content varies, but takes on what Wolfe called the mutually intelligible form in so-called mixture. So I'm centered on this key word, Brazilian exceptionalism, mixture. Uh, and in so doing, my paper wants to contribute to uh, scholarship on Arab Christian agency. <coughs> uh, and I'm uh, drawing upon Akram Khater's work, as well as the round table that was organized for Ismus uh, already almost a decade ago. Uh, the point being that uh, uh, whether Brazilians of Syrian Lebanese origin or, or, or converts to Syrian Lebanese Christianities, that they're not dupes, they're not apologists, they're protagonists, they're agents, and this idea that Brazil é diferente. Brazil is different. Um jabuticabal, that I can explain later. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's an ideological sort of fixture. Uh, Gilberto Freire, one of the most important figures in it, he was the first to celebrate conditions peculiar to Brazil, his masterpiece, Casa Grande e Senzala. Uh, is really the, the work that one thinks of. Freire, in this work, in, in subsequent uh, writings and speeches, he saw the Moors, who's Moors, a uh, little scene, really, uh, in, medieval, in the medieval Iberian past uh, as predisposing Portuguese to mix with Africans and Indians and attenuating racial antagonisms, as well as to, quote, preserve the influence of the Mohammedan upon Christian morality, end quote which created for him a more human and more lyric religiosity in Brazil. So these racial and religious linchpins of Brazilian exceptionalism remain influential today. Those scholars have long documented uh, very long and violent histories of discrimination and bigotry. So against this backdrop, a contradictory one, my paper argues that Arabs as well as non-Arabs contain and convert Eastern Rite and Orthodox Christian difference, mixing and feeling in Brazilian exceptionalism. The paper is going to have three parts. The first part, I, I talk uh, some conceptual historical uh, uh, points. Second part, focus on Syrian Lebanese Christians in a, in a wider re Brazilian religious field. And the third part, on, on converts, mostly, and their relationships with originarios or those born into uh, Syrian Lebanese Christian uh, uh, religions. Uh, so similar to the numbers that uh, uh, Stephen had mentioned, uh, from 1908 to 1941, Jeffrey Lesser found that almost two-thirds of Lebanese migrants declared themselves as Catholic, uh, a quarter Muslim, uh, while over half of Syrian migrants uh, uh, were Orthodox, and almost one quarter Catholic. So Milton Hatun, uh, pictured here, uh, his father, he was his father's Shia Lebanese migrant, his mother a Brazilian born uh, Maronite Lebanese. Uh, he is, uh, I think arguably, but I think he is the most famous writer alive today uh, in Brazil. Uh, and he frames this kind of difference, uh, a religious difference, in exceptional terms. Hatun criticized being labeled a quote unquote Lebanese Brazilian writer in the US. Uh, he was visiting actually uh, Berkeley in California. This was, I think, in the 90s. Uh, Hatun told his U.S. interlocutor, he came across his uh, adver advertisement that said Lebanese Brazilian writer, and he said, he told his interlocutor, a Lebanese Brazilian category makes no sense in Brazil, uh, which he described as a country formed through quote unquote racial mixing. Uh, and, he, and these are his words. He emphasized the quote, co coexistence of different ethnicities and origins in Brazil. 
even at the risk of appearing utopian. Like Hatun, Syrian Lebanese make exceptional claims to a universality grounded in Brazil. But from the 1870s through the 1970s, so-called Quatrocentões, Luso Brazilian elites, similar to the label of WASP in the US, but obviously they're not Protestants, they're Catholic, they saw Syrian Lebanese Christians as neither overly familiar nor sufficiently exotic uh, in what Paulo Pinto called an unsettling ambiguity. Because that means they could, they could accept Syrian Lebanese Christian migrants that they were represented as escaping a putatively ferocious Muslim world. Um, despite the fact that demographically significant migrant waves from Mount Lebanon only began three decades after the 1860 conflict, as Akron Khan did, has pointed out. But Roman Catholic Brazilian elites barred Syrian Lebanese from their own social circles, leading Christian majority Syrian Lebanese to found hundreds of country clubs named after their places of origin, such as uh, this that comes from the work of Stacey Farentel, an image of a, of a club, of a sitting room, in, in the Nadir Hamsi, the, the Homs, uh, the Ruby Homs in Sao Paulo, which uh, is in a different place now. Uh, the bourgeois and Catholic dominant sensibility of these social spaces entered and eclipsed Maronite and Orthodox, as well as other mutual aid societies that had begun to be founded by 1897, as well as the first churches constructed not long after. So really the, the institution, I would say, gravity was around these social clubs and rather than the uh, uh, religious organizations. So the question is, the Syrian Lebanese Christians, and they fit into Gilberto Freire's vision of a mixed nation, I guess the answer would be yes and no. Uh, that Freudian inspired Brazilian pundits uh, voiced fears of Syrian Lebanese in group marriage in Um And there was a, a historian, uh, Mont, uh, Brian Pitts, um, who wrote a thesis on, uh, on uh, religiosity, faith, and among uh, Arabs in Sao Paulo. He found that the majority of children baptized from the 50s through the 1970s. Uh, working in the Orthodox Cathedral in São Paulo, that they had fathers and mothers with Arabic last names. And so you see this in the chart. You see in 59, so in the red. So most of those children baptized had uh, Arab parents. But then in the, in the, in the, uh, through the 70s, this was the case. And then in the 90s, you see, we see in the, in the 80s and 90s especially, uh, that, that generally, uh, that it was an Arab father and a non-Arab mother. And that changed in 2005, it evened out. However, for those two decades, there was this gendered asymmetry of mixture. And it bears that masculinist imprint of Brazilian exceptionalism. Lebanese Christian origins think of themselves as different, not simply in relation to Syrian Lebanon, but also in relation to Brazil. Um, first, I'll focus on Maronite identity. Uh, and I, I want to stress, the, the main point is that it, it takes shape, it doesn't only dissolve, but it also emerges from Roman uh, Catholicism. And in particular, the Roman Catholic Church's strategy to compete with evangelical Christianity. Uh, Dom Edgar Maggi, uh, uh, who uh, uh, Diogo Bersito uh, has interviewed personally, I never met him personally, but he, everyone uh, raves about him as a charismatic figure, uh, uh, pictured here on the upper left hand of the slide, uh, he took over, uh, he inherited a, a shrinking Nossa Senhora do Libano Cathedral in São Paulo in 2006, and he reversed what his predecessor had called the Latinization of Maronites. And Maji increased by tenfold uh, the Maronite flocks, tapping into the Brazilian Catholic Church's char charismatic movement. Seen here, the symbol, the Renovação Charismática Católica do Brasil. Uh, Maji asked for assistance from Monsignor Jonas Sabi himself of Lebanese descent, but raised Roman Catholic. In 1978, Abib had founded Canção Nova, a media arm of this charismatic movement. And so Maji took a, a play from his uh, a book uh, and began building this Maronite identity. So Maronite, being Maronite, adopts, this, uh, adopts not the content, but the form of Roman Catholicism in Brazil. Arabs, likewise, have shaped and have been shaped by evangelical Christianity, I've mentioned this uh, uh, when we're uh, discussing delightfully over coffee and lunch. Uh, this is Padre, uh, I'm sorry, Pastor Marcos Calisto, leads the Arab Evangelical Church of Curitiba. In his book, O Cristão e o Islamismo, as well as in sermons and interviews, Calisto warns against stereotyping Arabs and equating Arabs and Muslims, concluding that, quote, the biggest concern I have is that peoples will not pray 
for Arabs who are also loved by the Lord, end quote. So when President Brazilian, uh, when, I'm sorry, Brazilian President Bolsonaro considered moving the Brazilian embassy to Jerusalem in 2019, Calisto went on Facebook and reminded him and others of several biblical passages about Assyria and Egypt to quote, in his words, in Calisto's words, not lose sight of the same love that God had for both Israel and Arabs, in his words. Arabs also have converted uh, to espiritismo, uh, the belief in and communication with spirits. Here is uh, one of many uh, cases, Niazi Shafi, who has since uh, passed away. He grew up Orthodox, uh, with parents heading from Homs. Uh, he, his family frequented the Orthodox Church, I think the first in Brazil, the picture on the right. Uh, in 1940, he converted to uh, spiritualism. His father, though initially strange, forgave him on his deathbed. Shofi continued, Today I am certain that it is my father who guides me. I had this proof when he appeared before me for the first time on the 24th of December, 1942, in the garden of my home. And since that time, he speaks with his father in spiritist meetings. Uh, and he hinted in a, a news article that, and he usually had made the press because he was a, a staple on who in São Paulo. Uh, he said that some Syrian Lebanese did not accept him, but he held firm to Brazilian exceptionalism, remarking, here in Brazil, there is no prejudice of race or religion. Uh, Syrian Lebanese exceptional understandings also take place through Umbanda and Candomblé syncretic Afro-Brazilian religions that are respectfully felt in Rio de Janeiro and uh, Bahia. So Jamil Rashid, uh, pictured here, uh, became a key figure both in Sao Paulo. Uh, Jamil Rashid is, is the son of Lebanese migrants. He spoke of his mother as frequenting what he called the Igreja Maior Ortodoxa Maronita, blending Orthodox and Maronite Christianities like the very syncretism of the Afro-Brazilian faiths. How could that he do it? came to lead. How could he do it? It seems blasphemous, right? <laughs> uh, and one could say, you know, was he just confused? I don't think I never interviewed him personally, but I don't think I think that he reflects the syncretic nature of the Brazilian religious field. Uh, in 1955, when he drew up the statutes of the the biggest organization of Bumbona Gamble in São Paulo, he defined. Um, Umbanda as, syncretism, as a Afro-Aboriginal national syncretism, Christian and spiritist. And in a 2009 documentary, he repeated that Umbanda is an exceptionally national religion declaring Umbanda é Brasil. Umbanda <laughs> is Brazil. Uh, this last part I want to focus on converts. So in, in parallel ways, Brazilians with no Syrian or Lebanese origins transit and convert to Syrian Lebanese Christianity. As, uh, as Alejandro Frejerio observes, Brazilian social scientists of religion speak of transit rather than conversion in order to better foreground the passaging, or, uh, I'm sorry, passaging, uh, not the landscape, the, the passage of the, uh, and the pertenças múltiplas, multiple belongings or multiple memberships. Uh, uh, some have found that nearly a quarter of Brazilians experiment with more than one religion, and that percentage is double among self-identified evangelicals. Uh, so, uh, keeping in mind Frejerio's point that uh, passages and convergence can exist at quote unquote the same time, uh, you know, I, I keep my my focus on non-Arab churchgoers, but how they encompass Syrian Lebanese Christian difference, whether they're passing through or actually settling into. Eastern Rite or Orthodox Christianities. In what some described as an enchantment, uh, converts place Eastern Rite and Orthodox Christianities in a structure of common difference in Brazil, echoed by the Syrian Lebanese cited on the slide here. Uh, uh, one convert from a uh, Roman, uh, Roman Catholic convert to Syriac Orthodoxy stated, I'm not a Syrian origin, I'm really Brazilian. This conversion began when he began to notice ritualistic differences, such as the Syriac priest being able to marry, which he found was more, uh, made him more relatable, uh, but also uh, what he viewed as similarities, so, uh, such as the belief in Jesus Christ, according to him. A Roman Catholic who became Melkite likewise spoke of being attracted to a distinct rite of the same church, whose mass was held in greco arabi Greek Arab which led him to study more Greek and more Arabic, and he concluded that the Eastern Rite helped me in my personal human process in the discovery 
of God. Clergy, meanwhile, uh, claim the universality of Orthodox, uh, universality for Orthodox Christianity in Brazil. Uh, Padre Rafael, who's uh, pictured here in the middle, he actually studied in Balaman and uh, in uh, Lebanon, the theology school. He's Argentine by, by birth and by growing up. Uh, he studied in Lebanon, he returned, I think, to Argentina, and then has been in Brazil for, I think, a couple of decades. I mentioned him before. So he, he had said that among the nearly 3,000, so he, he's uh, 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 a priest of two parishes, uh, one in uh, Goiânia and the other one in Ipamiri in Goiás, the state of Goiás in the sort of the Midwest of Brazil. Uh, he said uh, among the nearly 3,100 baptisms and over 300 marriages that he carried out, the majority have been Brazilian, and only about a third, of, a third have been Syrian or Lebanese. Um, he explained that non-Arab Brazilians increasingly participate in the church, that's pictured the outside part on the left, the inside part on the right, uh, even singing in the church choir. When I asked him what, what brings all of these non uh, Orthodox, mostly overwhelmingly Roman Catholic to, to Orthodoxy, uh, he said, and, and this kept on being repeated, not simply by clergy, right, but by Syrian Lebanese in general, just that Brasileiro tem uma sede espiritual. It, it was always said, no, they're, they're much more they're spiritual. There's a spiritual sort of essence that was uh, associated. In 2015, in this picture here, he received the honorary title of citizen of Goiás in the chambers of the state legislative assembly. And his acceptance speech gave thanks to a Roman Catholic priest who had nominated him as vice president of his church's association. And he concluded, Padre Rafael uh, uh, concluded, this is ecumen ec ec ecumenism. Indeed, non-Arab Brazilians are becoming priests in the Orthodox Church. In 2018, I've changed the name. Uh, Padre Felipe was ordained a priest of the São Jorge parish in Brasilia, the, the picture that I had shown initially on the slide. Uh, he was born and raised in Roman Catholicism, but he felt in his words a deep spiritual connection to orthodoxy. He had organized the Ahayal uh, Arabi, uh, worked with Brazilian converts, set it up, assisted in the preparation of Middle Eastern food that was instructed by a handful of, of Syrian Orthodox women. Uh, in response to my own introduction as being born and raised Maronite, it was really a confession. I always have to apologize. Uh, as I say that, he said, no, he expressed some regret uh, 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 at not uh, thinking about the Melkite right as well, embodying this fine line between passage and conversion. So in conclusion, I want to say that this São Jorge parish in Brasilia holds a glimpse of what Arab Christianity might look like in Brazil's uncertain future. A church pillar of Syrian origins by the name of Brasil Hello, who was very active in Ferrari, um, and uh, a church pillar had remarked to me that this is the inside of St. George Parish in, uh, in Brasilia. And it was actually designed by Oscar Nimai. Um, and actually, Brazil had an uh, engineer by training had done work with him. And, uh, and then instead of payment, he said, Can you design uh, our church? And, uh, and I think this was his last, Nimai's last actual creation. Uh, and so um, he said, We are passing this on to the next generation, he told me. And then in the in the in conversation, I, I just said that his children came up. His children were uh, raised Roman Catholic. They they do not actually frequent there. And so the the Saint George's Church's parishioners are now mostly made up of Brazilians with no Arab ancestry, as had pointed out by Father Felipe mentioned earlier. They attend not only the Sunday Mass but also events um, such as that Ahaya Arabi. Uh, so the mixture of Arabs and non-Arabs in Maronite, Melkite, and Orthodox churches points to both this containment and this convertibility or conversion of Arab-Christian difference in Brazil's religious transit. Arab-Christian difference follows Brazilian exceptionist thinking, bears its mark. Indeed, the significance of studying Syrian Lebanese Christianities and converts in Brazil or even elsewhere in Latin America, as my colleagues will say, lies in blurring binary understandings of what makes them unique and ordinary, different and common. They're mixing and feeling across unanticipated geographies and unexpected histories are a much needed correction uh, in the still dominant exceptionalist understandings of the Middle East, uh, which either erase or usually twist the historical configuration of Christian difference in Muslim majority societies. Thank you so much.